what you want, when you want it, where you want it. This is The Mesh. U.S. health advisors want you to know your health coverage does not have to be complicated. If you aren't happy with your insurance plan, there are unlimited and comprehensive medical plan options available to you right now. U.S. health advisors offer solutions which can't be found anywhere else. They can even offer you the ability to purchase more coverage if and when you need it. U.S. Health Advisors offers fair rates and no surprises. Sounds nice, doesn't it? If you'd like to know more, contact U.S. Health Advisors at 828-554-3032 or by email at daniel.bryant at ushadvisors.com. Foot Candle Films. Film news and reviews from two guys who really like movies. This episode is brought to you by the Foot Candle Film Society. For a schedule of upcoming screenings and membership information, visit the Society's website at www.footcandle.org. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Foot Candle Films here on TheMesh.TV. My name is Alan Jackson. I am co-director and co-founder of the Foot Candle Film Society and the Foot Candle Film Festival. With me, as always, Chris Fry, also a co-director and co-founder of both the same two organizations. Chris, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I am keeping my head just barely above the level of screeners that has begun to pile up on my desk. Yes. Um, so it's the year end. Lots of studios are sending screeners and things for people to look at for awards or just consideration for year end lists. So uh it is that time of year. It is a fun time of year, but it is. yet it is a little overwhelming. I agree with you. <laughs> this is kind of our first full year, kind of really deep into the screening territory as True. film critics. And uh, every day going home to the mailbox is like, it's like Christmas. It's like, <laughs> what films do I get to screen today? Right. And uh, so the good news for all of our infinite number of listeners out here. Yes. Is that we're going to have a lot of films over the next few months to definitely be talking about ones that we're going to be seeing uh, as they get right. closer to award season and ones that may be possible contenders that we'll get to talk about. Yep. Um, the bad news is that Chris and I won't have much of a social life outside of work <laughs> <That's right. laughs> for a Watching while. movies. Yes, but that's okay. I could think of uh, only a few other ways I'd rather spend my time. So that's that's sure. okay. All right, well, Chris, we got a full show today. This is Foot Candle Films. It's our movie review and discussion show here on TheMesh.TV. And we have two films that we're going to be reviewing in full today. First up will be the latest from director and writer Robert Eggers. It's The Lighthouse. Uh, it's his follow-up to the film The Witch that we spoke about and talked about it maybe last year. And then we'll follow it up with a review of the upcoming Netflix film Marriage Story, written and directed by Noah Baumbach, starring jo Scarlett Johansson and Adam Driver. From there, we'll go into our kind of our news segments. We've got several news items, uh, topics to cover. Uh, Chris has got a soapbox to share. We're going to talk about a couple new trailers coming out and also uh, discussing a film that... Could it be good? That's going to be the name of our segment, I think. It's got to rise at the, at the end. Could this be good? Because it's a question mark at the end. Uh, it's a film that, you know, sounds like maybe has some interesting elements, but we want to pick it apart and say, does it sound like it's going to be something we're going to get excited about or not? Then we'll wrap up the show with our recommendations of the episode. Chris and I both providing one film that we think is worth your time to check out. I know my film is already going to receive some scorn from my co-host, so I'm looking forward to that. But otherwise, we got a full show. Uh, Chris, are you ready to get started going into our first review? Absolutely. So our first review, as I mentioned, is the latest from director and writer Robert Eggers, starring Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson. This is The Lighthouse. Timberman want with being a wiki. Just looking to earn a living. It's like any man. Starting new. On the run. Chris, we discussed Robert Eggers' film The Witch uh, at last year during our podcast, and you and I both had positive feelings towards the film. I seem to recall maybe I liked it a little bit more. Is that true? I don't remember. You? Uh, I 
don't know. Um, I definitely remember discussing it. I remember I liked it, but maybe you were a little stronger on it, maybe? We both liked, both liked it. it. I think we thought it was really a great kind of uh, introduction to this new uh, director that we weren't mm-hmm. familiar with. And uh, just we really applauded the style, the production value, the tone that was set. I think tone was a big thing we talked about a lot with the film when I remember discussing it. Um, it's also the film where we were uh, introduced to Anna Taylor-Joy, who has gone on to make several movies since then. But I think that was the first thing we recognized her from there. Well, in Robert Eggers' latest film, The Lighthouse, he brings in two fairly heavy hitter actors. We've got Willem Dafoe. And Robert Pattinson. Robert Pattinson's been doing some really interesting work in the last few years. And uh, maybe dovetailing into a new segment we'll be doing later as we talk about a future role he'll be taking on uh, as a certain Cape Crusader. But uh, the two of them paired together. We had this hypnotic hallucinatory, hallucinatory tale of two lighthouse keepers on a remote and mysterious New England island back in the 1890s. The film, dialogue-wise, is exclusively these two characters. There's some interesting ways that the film was both shot and presented on the screen. Chris, my big question for you is, if tone was something that I think we both admired in The Witch, and kind of the sense of dread and uh, just the impending doom or impending horrors that were to come, how does this film fit use? How is its use of production design style? Is it an enhancement to the film? We're using a square ratio presentation where it's a little more square frame, black and white, very heavy film stock, very atmospheric shooting. Does that add to the value of this film in your mind? Did it help it make a, a really great experience for you? Or do you feel like it was working in spite of story characters or anything else the film had to share? In other words, What's your thoughts on the film, and and how did the production design affect it anyway? Well, you know, production design and the things you mentioned, like being shot in black and white, the square aspect ratio, you know, if there could be a – if that could be kind of glommed together and made as a best actor category, like, you know, Mm -hmm. like just call the cinematography and the black and white aspect, call that like an actor in the film – that should get like the best actor nomination from the lighthouse because like that's, that's working harder than anything else in the film. We had an interesting location. We have an interesting building. Sure. We have the the lighthouse itself. We have, you know, the, the water and the nautical theme. Yeah. So there's a lot of production design. And and even, you know, you heard a little bit in the trailer there, the sound design Mm -hmm. and the, just the way they, the mix sound mixing, um, all of those elements really make this an experience. Um, then you have, like you mentioned, Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson acting, and it's basically the two of them, and that's yeah. it. There's no dialogue from anybody else. Right. A couple other characters pop up, but Correct. not really play a huge part. Correct. So it's you know it's basically like a two man film, um, and they you know, are acting, you know, out of a scale of 10, they're both acting at an 11, Mm -hmm. um, which I didn't find distracting. Um, I thought, you know, it added to my enjoyment of the film. I will say as far as how it fits in with Robert Eggers, I mean, he's only made one other film, The Witch. It's like he took that film and, you know, he's like interested in horror, apparently. And so he's like, okay, I'm going to make another horror movie, but I'm going to, and it's not going to be your typical, you know, mm-hmm. slasher. Or, you know, I'm going to somehow make it different. Apparently, he's a big fan of period type pieces because mm-hmm. the first one was colonial type, yeah. and uh, this one's settlers 1890s type nineties or so. Um, yeah, yeah, so this one's a little bit, century. little bit, you know, further along in the timeline of history, but still, you know, mm-hmm. set back in a period of time, and just. Unlike The Witch, you know, you could say where that was very sleek and the production design was very sleek. This one, having it be black and white, had the aspect ratio. It almost, if you didn't recognize Defoe and Pattinson, I could almost be fooled into thinking that this was kind of a little known classic horror film that had been done around the time of Frankenstein or Dracula mm-hmm. or yeah. Wolfman. So I appreciated it for that and that it just it really sinks into the genre that it's trying to go after. Mm-hmm. Um, I hear a butt coming. Well, over than the things that are over and above what I've already praised about it, that's kind of where my appreciation of the film mm-hmm. kind of stops. Okay. Um, I think that this 
it's a very niche film. I, mm-hmm. I liked it okay, but it, you know, it's that cursed word, which curses play a part in this movie. Yes. It's the curse word of fun. Right. Um, it was not, there wasn't enough meat on the bones of this horror movie to keep me thoroughly engaged. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just fun. <laughs> What's kind of your take? Uh, no, I think you and I are on the same page with this. Okay. All my notes say that I love the look of the film. Mm-hmm. I love some of the visual elements. There are some shots that I think are pretty amazing and haunting and, and things that still stick in my brain. I'll kind of mention a few of those in a little bit. So everything with the look of the film and the style of the film was great. I just, I'm with you. I just don't feel like it had a lot to hold it together as a film. It was more of a montage of really interesting set pieces and scenes and dialogue bits and speeches by the two characters, but it just as a whole didn't fit for me as a film. So I, I came out wondering, not quite sure what I was supposed to get from it. <laughs> yeah. And I almost feel like, and this is a little bit my, my question with the film too, is I have no problem with films that leave it up to the interpretation of the audience. I actually like those films quite a bit where they give you just enough to start to form some ideas, right. but they're going to leave it up to you to interpret it. Sure. I think this film might have gone a little too far in that direction and say, we're just going to throw a whole lot of stuff on the screen, a whole lot of ideas. Why don't you guys as an audience figure out what you want to do with all this? And it's like, we're just more interested in showing some really interesting scenes and moments that we have in our script. I know that's not what they were thinking, but that's kind of how I felt as an audience member. Is I felt like there was, we were being put too much heavy lifting on us, where the film didn't do enough lifting story wise to really give me anything to hang on to uh, by the end. Yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, I think you and I both appreciate films where they give us the puzzle pieces, but then it's up to us. Maybe they at least put the frame there, but yeah. then it's up to us to kind of finish putting the puzzle together. I didn't together. know where the frame of this film was at all. So. And yeah, I'm kind of on the same lines with you. It's just kind of, and even like, you know, the, some of the frame pieces are so kind of jaggedly cut mm-hmm. that you're just kind of like, okay, I think that's what they're going for here, but it's not, not in a satisfying way. The, the loose ends are too loose and frayed at the mm-hmm. end to really tie together and make a cohesive whole I still admire it, though. Yeah, I do, too. I'm still interested, and it's not like he just, you know, went back to the same pattern that he used for The Witch oh, and no. just replicate. Nope, he's definitely making, you know, interesting films. I, I look forward to seeing what he does next. I was going to say, this film actually still makes me even more interested to see what he does next, even right. though it itself didn't quite work for me. I liked what he was trying to do. Right. And I liked, again, the look of the film is more than half the reason to go see the film in my mind too. Yeah. Um, I'm going to kind of pick out a few things I really sure. liked and I've got to go a little more detail on a few things that, that didn't work as well. We mentioned the look of the film. Uh, it, it looks, you mentioned like the old classic, uh, hammer horror films, which I agree. Sure. That's very much that style. I also saw a lot of Bergman. I kind of felt like mm-hmm. a little bit of a uh, Ingmar Bergman f- f- film. There's a few moments where it's just some shots of their faces I'm like, oh, yeah, this this could have been a 1950s, 60s uh, art film. I can see that. As well. So it's a little bit of that going on. Um, I thought both the performances were good. I thought Defoe was better. But I also think Defoe was was playing to his strengths. I mean, he right. this part was custom made for Willem Defoe. Pattinson, I felt like, had a little more trouble trying to figure out exactly who his character was. But I think that's... Maybe, kind uh, of maybe a little bit of it, but I still feel like he was struggling as an actor to kind of give us mm. a cohesive character at times. Mm. It was still good. I okay. liked his performance a lot. It was intriguing, but Defoe kind of just was spot on. I mean, he, he knew exactly how to play this, this bit. And I mentioned images. There are some moments in the film that I feel like are, are pretty impressive. There's a, uh, there's a moment at the very end of the film with the actual lighthouse itself and something that happens in the lighthouse that is both horrific and with the sound design and the way the shot, it was, it's going to stick with me for a while. That was a pretty crazy, crazy little sequence. There's a moment about two thirds of the way through the film where it's almost like we're cut to a, almost a painting looking of, of Defoe's character over Pattinson's character and almost in a painting, like he's a, Painted in a, oh, I have a hard time even describing it. It's a very unique shot with light glowing out of the eyes of Defoe's character. And As he's kind of going on a rant. Yeah, yeah. And it's just some of those little moments are like, whoa, that was pretty impressive. Those were really cool shots to see. 
some of the nautical film, weaving in the nautical elements of the film were also pretty impressive. So there are moments um, that I thought were pretty interesting. Pattinson has a, a very interesting sequence with a seagull mm-hmm. <laughs> that doesn't end very well for the seagull. And that one was pretty, it was a pretty interesting sequence to watch as well. So there were great moments, but again, I, that's where my likes kind of stop is I feel like, again, everything's based on the moments and the look and not as much the story and what it was really pulling together. So You talked a little bit about, you know, kind of how you appreciate different moments and specific shots with how they were, you know, framed in the cinematography. I kind of go with some of the technical aspects that I appreciate as well. You know, you talked about the close-ups, mm-hmm. but then there were certain times where he paid attention to the tracking shot down a hallway with the sides of the hallway so you could see, like, the wood providing the sides of the mm-hmm. already small square frame. Yeah. So it helped just kind of narrow things down and make you feel claustrophobic. Likewise, there were sometimes some, I guess what you would call crane shots going between the levels of the lighthouse. Mm-hmm. It was almost like you saw the wood joists in between the floor or just different things. And it was very kind of Alfred Hitchcock in some ways, mm-hmm. the way he would do some camera movements. So even though it was confined within a lighthouse, he did a pretty good job of keeping things visually interesting. Oh, yeah. so. Well, what I love the fact is that you can look from the outside of this lighthouse structure and the house adjoining it, and you feel like you've got a good lay of the land. Mm-hmm. But then when you're inside, it's more confusing. You're actually not quite sure where everything is and how they get from one place to the next. So sure. and again, I think very intentional to Probably. give you that feeling of these are two men that you don't know how long they've been in this place and you don't know exactly what their role is in this place uh, for most of the film. So uh, I get the reason for making it feel very confusing when you're inside the house or inside the lighthouse. You know, interesting talking about confusing and how we've mentioned like what they were going for. One of the, <laughs> one of the opening shots that confused me right off the bat and I still, if you're not going into spoiler territory, probably can't say too much about it. Mm-hmm. But it confused me right off the bat because it was almost like they were looking at the camera, at the movie audience, and it's in the trailer. Yeah. Um, It's a shot of Pattinson in the foreground and Defoe's Mm -hmm. kind of behind him, and it's like they're both carrying some things, and they're staring just, you know, dead into the camera. Well, they do a a reverse shot to kind of make it look like they're watching the boat leave. But, But I think it's deeper than that. I think that's what, you know they kind of show us after a while that that's what they're looking at. But right. yeah, no, I think there's something to that. It's just really odd. And yeah, there are definitely, it's a film that generates theories. I mean, sure. I've got two different theories on what may be going on here. It's not anything I can share without going without into spoilers, spoilers. but yeah. I do have two different theories. The problem is Chris is that, and I love the idea of a film making you generate your own theories of what's going on. Sure. But I feel like the film is so open and so nondescript on what it's trying to do that I could come up with probably 12 different theories and they would all fit. <laughs> sure. Which at that point you wonder, okay, what is the job of the filmmaker? What are they trying to do? What, what are they, what path are they wanting to lead us down? I like the path to be a little hazy and we cut our own path off of that, but to kind of just throw all the elements on the screen and say, yeah, just go figure something out. It's kind of how I feel like it is. So yeah, I've got two or three theories that could perfectly work. Hmm. Who knows? But I don't know. I don't have any leanings toward one or the other because it really could be anything. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. A couple, really just playing off the things that didn't work for me. I think most of it we've already talked about. Uh, Just, you know, the, really the the story just didn't keep me engaged the way it was being told. Part of it was, I think the pacing, it was a very uneven pacing. Sure. We're very used to a film that like this, where it's going to build dread. Even the witch was one where just dread got built. It's kind of very slow and steady, but you could tell things were coming. You could tell. Yeah. Here it's almost like they threw in moments of dread early on and then they backed it off. And it's like, then you kind of go back to a, little more casual uh, style film and then it ramps back up again. It just seemed to be kind of all over the place on its tone and its pacing made it a little frustrating to watch because I felt like last, I knew where it was going. And then, right. And then the last like 10 minutes or so, they just crank it up into, yeah, it's like, all right, let's just go nuts with it. And here <laughs> you go, throw everything on the table that we've been playing with. Right. Um, the only other thing I'll say that I thought was a problem with the film. I'm curious for you is the sound of dialogue was really hard for me to hear. And I heard other people in the theater saying that. 
And I thought maybe it was just our screening, but I've actually heard another podcast talk about it and saying, yeah, they had a hard time. They probably feel like they probably missed 20, 25 percent of the dialogue from just the way it was mixed and presented. And I, that certainly was the case for me. I had some real hard times hearing some of the, the the characters' dialogue. I didn't really have trouble hearing them as much as I didn't know what they were saying because of the accents. Well, that um, no, I felt like I felt like I, yeah. I felt like I definitely heard it, and you know, sound mixing I think like was really you know intentional, and the sound design was really intentional. Like there's a foghorn, basically you feel like you hear it every <laughs> five or ten seconds. But Again, it's more spread out, very than intentional. That. So, and there yeah. you hear waves, and you hear yeah. like clanking. And, um, so sometimes I did feel like I couldn't understand what they were saying, but it wasn't a matter of volume or mix. It was just a matter of like, especially Defoe seemed to be very. Accent, it's like an old yeah. seaman or whatever. I don't know thick, what he was saying. Rich accent. Yeah. And when you, when you have that, and you have maybe not the best sound mixing of it in your theater presentation, when it's hard to make out almost a quarter of the words you're hearing, which is about where I was, it does make mm. it a little tough. Oh. I don't think it would have changed my opinion of the film if I had heard every single word, but it's still something that was a little more frustrating to watch with this. So. Hmm. Um, do you have any other likes, dislikes, anything you want to call out from the film? No, that's uh, pretty much my my thoughts. I, I guess I would say that you know, it was an interesting experiment, mm-hmm. kind of a uh, black and white shining set in a lighthouse, yeah. the shining set in a lighthouse. There's a little bit of that. I would recommend it for fans of what I'm going to call, and you know, if I'm coining the term, then I expect royalties, the alt art horror genre. Okay. Gotcha. That will probably seem dull to most audiences. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and with this alt art horror, I'm <laughs> talking about Midsummer. I'm talking about Hereditary. I'm talking about The Witch. Yeah. I'm talking about It Follows. Where so, jump scares and uh, bloody death is not really their first and foremost thing. It is building a, a more of a sense of right. dread, uh, dread right. and horror around you. Maybe sometimes mental horror and, and other types. So yeah, I got there you. you. Go. Now that definitely, this is like the poster child for that new movement yeah. you just described. It really is. I'm shocked. I mean, we're, we're in Western North Carolina. We're in a, a town called Hickory. I'm shocked. It's playing here. Me too. It is about the farthest reaching film I could imagine playing here. And didn't come out before Halloween. Not that this yeah, is yeah. your typical horror movie, no. but at least if people saw the trailer, they'd be like, yeah. what's this thing about? And it would be like weird or whatever. But, but you know, other films you mentioned in this new genre you're creating, you know, Midsummer actually had some more popular appeal. Right. Uh, Hereditary got a lot of acclaim when it came out. Absolutely. Uh, you know, The Witch got a lot of acclaim. Mm-hmm. This is one that it's of all those films you mentioned is the most out there. It's mm-hmm. the most Alternative. It's the most unique, and it, what and it's what it's trying to do. And I think you know, kudos to Robert Eggers. I guess I, I liked The Witch better than this. There mm-hmm. are certain aspects of oh, like, absolutely. Lighthouse yeah. I liked better than The Witch, but overall, as two films, if you're yeah. just comparing, I like The Witch better. But kudos to him for kind of you know cramping down on like what he was going for and like making a period thing. And he's like, because I think. You know, this film wouldn't have been effective if it had been in color. And The Witch, oh, no. maybe it's like, you know, as a first film, okay, I'm not going to go too crazy with it because, you know, color is going to appeal more than black and white. A yeah. normal aspect ratio is not going to fi- freak people out. But with The Lighthouse, maybe he has a little bit more carte blanche to do what he wants. And he's like, no, I'm going to make this exactly like I want to make well, it. Well, and you got to so, imagine, I, I'm, and I'm guessing for Mr. Eggers, which is never a good thing to do, but I would imagine if he had had his druthers, the witch would have been black and white with the same Could square be. ratio because it really lends itself to that. It would yeah. have really played well with that type of yeah. filmmaking style. But I agree with you. I think he he knew he had to make something that was at least a little marketable. Sure. Uh, and The Lighthouse is a challenging film. Uh, I think there's a lot of interesting visual elements to the film. I think if you're a fan of a really strong production design and the look of the film and the environment and the structures and – kind of everything that's in the frame around you, you'll have probably a really interesting time watching this film. But I will say if you're looking for a more cohesive story and something you can really grab a hold of and feel like you can, you can wrestle with afterwards, this one's going to be a tough one for you. I'm afraid. Right. Yeah. I had an interesting crowd watching the film with me just yesterday at our local theater. Um, okay, how many people were there? There were about 10 people there. Okay, that's about and, the size of crowd yeah, I had. And about half of them, I could tell, totally knew what they were getting into, were ready for it. The other half, no idea. <laughs> and I happened to sit right behind a couple that very clearly 
did not watch the trailer, did not read anything about this film. <laughs> Which can a, be an awesome way to go be, into it. Could be, but they spent the entire film talking to each other or trying to figure out just what the hell was going on. Gotcha. <laughs> so that was a little distracting as well. That might have hurt my ability to hear the dialogue. Probably. So, so, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that is The Lighthouse. It is in limited release, but as we said, with it playing in a town like Hickory, that means it's probably playing a lot more unique places than we would have expected. Uh, we are both not crazy about it. I guess uh, lukewarm. There's elements about it we liked, but overall it's not one we really care need to revisit again or have a strong recommendation for. Is that fair to say? Sure. Okay. All right, so let's move on to our second film, and that is going to be a Netflix film. Um, It is coming out in December on Netflix, but we had a chance to check up on it. It is the latest from writer-director Noam Baalbeck. The film is Marriage Story. What I love about Nicole, she is a mother who plays, really plays. What I love about Charlie, he loves being a dad. He loves all the things you're supposed to hate, like waking up at night. She knows when to push me and when to leave me alone. He never lets other people keep him from what he wants to do. Dad, you're too far. I know. It's not easy for her to close a cabinet. He's incredibly neat. She's brave. He's brilliant. He's very competitive. So Marriage Story, as you said, was newest by Noah Baumbach, tells the story of a couple at the end of their marriage as divorce is looming. The couple, a theater director, Charlie, played by Adam Driver, and actress Nicole, played by Scarlett Johansson, have dreams and aspirations that once united them, but now are pushing them apart. A quote from divorce lawyer Bert Spitz from the film, played by Alan Alda, says, Criminal lawyers see bad people at their best, Divorce lawyers see good people at their worst. In Marriage Story, do you feel we are seeing Baumbach, Jans- Johansson, and Driver at their best or worst, not as lawyers, but as film goers? Right. Easy to answer. Uh, best, best, and best. Okay. So, um, yeah, I am over the moon about this film, so I could probably talk about it for quite a while, but I will say, yes, I've I've seen most of Noah Baumbach's films, not all of them. Okay. Um this is my favorite of his films. Okay. I think it's the best performance jo- uh, um, Scarlett Johansson's given. Okay. I'm not going to say it's the best Adam Driver performance because, honestly, I think a lot of his performances are really, really good. But this performance is right up there in that category. So I can't pick out if it's his best, but it's in the pantheon of Adam Driver performances that I like so far. So, yeah, I, I love it. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. And <laughs> mic drop. Yeah, I... This, yeah, Noah Baumbach, you know, we've reviewed a couple of his films here on the show while we were young. We've talked about, um, did we review Patterson? We did. Okay, but that wasn't Noah Baumbach, that was Adam Driver, sorry. That's right, just Adam Um, Driver. But uh, what are the other ones? Um, Francis Ha and Mistress America. I think I've recommended on the show and we've talked about a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've, I've had kind of a good relationship with him. Meyerowitz stories. We did review the Meyerowitz stories. We did. Yeah, I liked it. And I liked it, but I was, I think expectations kind of killed me because yeah. I was coming off the three films that I mentioned, mm-hmm. Francis Saw and Mistress America, while, while we were young. And I was just like, oh, yes, 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 yes. And then <laughs> Meyerowitz stories, which was okay, had some really strong parts, but overall, I just, it was really too shaggy for yeah. me. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was the good thing. Went into Marriage Story with. Pretty low <laughs> expectations, wow. I guess. Not lo- really low, but just for Noah uh, Baumbach, you were you were expecting it to carry on with the Meyerowitz stories, right? I was, and style. you know, it was like Meyerowitz stories that had come to Netflix yeah. first. That was right. his primary That's release. True. So with this, I was like, well, okay, you know, another Netflix type thing. Okay, um, but I come away, you know, I love the film. I really, yeah. really like it, and it's I think so good. <laughs> it is good, and it's also an example where. Um, which is strange to me that, you know, you talked about Adam Driver, Scarlett Johansson, and their performances, and we mentioned both of us are obviously, we're over the moon about the film, their performances must be good, but you have some supporting performances by Alan Alda, Laura Dern, Ray Liotta, and normally when, the you, lawyers. St- when you start, yeah, <laughs> yeah, when you start getting kind of a ensemble cast, a lot of times if I know that ahead of time, that helps ratchet my expectations up and kind of, and then it's kind of like a uh oh feeling because you're like, okay, you know, maybe it's just like a bunch of people do this because they're friends with them or whatever. And then mm-hmm. it's not, it's somehow just, a lot of times, I guess what I'm saying, a lot of times ensemble films seem like they don't really 
end up being as powerful as they could be if mm-hmm. you just kind of because maybe the fact that there are these like cameo type performances or semi strong supportive performances it just dilutes the overall power of the film maybe sure yeah and that for me in this film was not the case no, no, they all no, served no. awesome purposes and were really good in their roles well and what their supporting roles were for is they they added the level of, of absurdity to the story that the grounded story we have with Nicole and Charlie to kind of counteract that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the film, I'm going to say on one hand, very realistic depiction, kind of the horror of a marriage falling apart and kind of the impact of that. Right. But it was surrounded by this level of somewhat absurdity that kind of makes it, I mean, I've heard people refer to this as a, as a comedy, which I don't get that, but I definitely see there are moments where you know the absurdity of what's going on around you. And that's all played out by those three supporting actors playing lawyers. Right. Different style of lawyers that we're having to interact with. And they get to have the juicy parts. They get to have the the, the scene-chewing bits. And it's all kind of ridiculous when you watch those parts. But when you step back and you see the impact it has on our two main characters, that's where it really hits home that, okay, we're focused on these two characters these other people are impacting their lives now, right now, but we're still very much, even in those scenes, we're focused on our two main protagonists and what the impact is on them. So I, I love the way that they use those supporting roles and gave them a really big piece of scenery to chew on, but yet it never distracted you away from the two main characters themselves. Yeah. Well, and with the subject matter being divorce, I can see people not eager to see this film yeah. because, you know, it is heavy. It's not a happy type thing. I will say, though, that although I wouldn't call this a comedy by any stretch of the imagination, it is mm-hmm. a drama. But there are elements of comedy in the film that provide sure. enough levity that it's not just like a, you come out of this being like, oh, well, that was a one timer. It was right. good, but I don't want to see that again. Yeah. And there were enough little comedic bits that made it not just a, a drudgery to get through. And I appreciate that. And it was, it was a light kind mm-hmm. of a light touch with the comedy such that it didn't take away from the realism of what was going on. True. Um, so that it was, was a great balance. Great. Balance. Yeah. That's, right. That's when you a, needed a light moment of levity to kind of break it up, it was there. Right. Um, but yet it didn't overpower it. And it's still at its core, it was a very emotional film with these two characters. I also love the fact that counter to what we normally see in films like this, there are so many moments where the, the film could have tried to lead us to believe that Charlie and Nicole should get back together. Mm-hmm. But the film never went that route. I never once felt that way. My whole concern as a film goer was to watch and to make sure that they were still friends at the end. I had no intention of wanting to see them get back together again. <laughs> and I don't think the film did either. Every time you even flirted with that idea, they skirted around that so fast. So I can see a lot of people watching this thinking, oh, I hope they get back together. I'd really like to see them together again. No, no, no. The film, I think, is very clear that these two don't need to be together anymore. But we want them to be friends. We want them to work together. We want them to make this work, especially for the benefit of their child. So that's that's everything that's driving the film, which is great. So it's a very nice take on that. Um, Um, Yeah, I I think I would agree with that. And I think the way they – it's like they – Something as simple with the way they started the film Mm -hmm. Um, and was kind of the way they started the trailer was they have you hear voiceover from both uh, Charlie and Nicole saying things that they like about the other person. Mm -hmm. And it's intercut with, you know, sometimes warm moments, but sometimes a lot of funny moments of things about their, you know, their marriage partner. And you have this music from Mm -hmm. Randy Newman and you had a little bit of it there in the trailer. It's just very unique kind of. Fancy, not fancy. Well, fanciful in yeah. a way that it's like fun, uplifting, kind of like comedic music. Like that we're going to make a romantic rom-com. comedy. Yes, yeah, exactly. And you're kind of like, huh? That's an interesting way. And then it cuts to a scene that's in a a counselor's office for people going through a separation and or divorce, and it kind of totally changes tone, oh, yeah. but in a way that works. It's like mm-hmm. it slams into that scene. And then it's like, oh dear. And then yeah, you yeah. kind of dynamics start happening. And it goes from so one tension to, or one tone to another in the blink of an eye. And it totally works and is totally believable. I will say, I was a little nervous mm-hmm. at the conclusion of that scene, although I loved how it opened. I was a little nervous that one of the characters was really going to be pigeonholed yeah. 
as the bad person, Mm -hmm. as the evil person in this relationship, much like, you know, picking sides happens, unfortunately, in a lot of divorce and stuff. And I was afraid the one who's choosing not to participate in the correct in what's going on there. And I was afraid that that was going to happen with this. And then, but the film was much more balanced than that. Very, very balanced. And I think it's to the film's credit, like you say, that, um, at the end of the film, it ends the way it does. And things yeah. don't just, you know, they decide not to get divorced and everything's, you know, happy hunky dory because it just, it's a well handled divorce story. It's called marriage story, probably because if they just call it divorce story, <laughs> it wouldn't have the same. Yeah. It would be a little tougher sell. I'm but, so, but it, it really worked well. And yeah, like you said, there's no good guy, bad guy played here. I think the film gives equal parts to both characters and we get some sympathy for both characters. And we also see some things where we're like, Ooh, that was not good. What they just did. I don't like the fact that they did that. They both get those moments as well. And, uh, I agree with you on the opening 10 minutes or so. I thought it was perfect. The movie had me hooked right away. As soon as that whole sequence ended, I'm like, yep, I'm on board. I'm, I'm ready to go down the stream. I love the fact too, that even when things are getting, tense and things are getting heightened emotions later in the film and there's a lot of screaming matches or some real uh, tense angry moments there's still moments of tenderness which remind you these are two human two human beings that have shared a lot of experiences together i think in particular there's a haircut scene late in the film where hmm. they've just had some really knockdown down drag outs through their lawyers but yet he comes to show up to pick up the kid she comments about his hair is a little shaggy on the side and he needs a trim. She's like, you want me to cut your hair? Because that's what she used to do right. when they were together. And we have a nice little quiet moment of her cutting his hair. And it's like, that's not something a film would normally show you. When they're showing you that the two are at odds with each other, you're not going to see those moments of them still being human beings with each other, which I thought was really nice. Um, the courtroom scene, again, not going to add too much detail because I think it's worth seeing, but the big courtroom scene where you've got the two big boisterous over the top lawyers kind of fighting on their behalfs. Uh, it was fascinating how they chose so much to focus on Charlie and uh, Nicole and you're seeing their reactions to what's going on around them and how much it's paining them to see what's being hurled at the other person. And mm-hmm. it being hurled at themselves. Mm-hmm. It's really fascinating. Again, another viewpoint we don't normally see in a film like this. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think for me, um, I'll kind of, you know, I guess wrap up some of my thoughts on the film by saying, you know, I basically can think about kind of a top five of scenes from the film that really just made me love it. Um, the fifth one is the one you're starting at the bottom. The mm-hmm. fifth one is that courtroom scene with yeah. kind of ping ponging arguments going back and forth between the lawyers, <clears throat> which is, yeah, and just kind of it, not something you have typically seen in movies, but it was really well done, tough to watch, but very, very, very effective. Well, and it's tough because the callbacks to previous things in the film, comments that were made, mm-hmm. little actions that you thought were insignificant at the time, you know, it gets brought up that Charlie didn't buckle in a, a car seat properly. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's right. He totally didn't. Right. And then oh, uh, Nicole commented how she had had some drinks at the house while she was watching the kid. Oh, that come back up to bite her as well. You know, little things like that. You pained yourself. You pain, you're feeling the pain that they're feeling as these things are being used now as weapons against each other as opposed to just parts of their own life. Right. Um the next scene I would say was a, is a paper serving scene that happens in a kitchen, yeah. uh, played for laughs. So there's a little bit of comedy there, but there's also some underlying meaning that it, there's a weight to it. So it's not just purely something for laughs that there is weight there. Um, Adam driver breaking into song at one point was kind of a nice unexpected thing that happened. Um, there's a scene with yelling in an apartment with driver punching his fist through a wall. Um, which I'll just throw out here some trivia, Alan. I learned you. I know you know what scene I'm talking about because you've mm-hmm. kind of referenced it. Supposedly that whole scene was done in one take. Oh, wow! And it took two days to film because every time they would make a mistake or they had a break or something, they would have to start over. <laughs> so that scene took two days to wow. film. Wow, I can imagine how grueling a two days that. Must oh have yeah, because it's so. a very intense scene. So then, and then my number one would be a list reading by uh, the son Henry. With Charlie by his side, um, this is good, good stuff. Yeah, that one, that one got me. <laughs> yeah, that one got yeah, me. It would. <laughs> I think the ending is pitch perfect. Mm-hmm. I love the what, like the less shots we get of the film are just perfect. Made the film work uh, from top to bottom. Yeah, and I think, and then there's also a scene I thought was just 
the way it played out was pretty fascinating. The, uh, the scene with, I'll say, the razor blade. And it's not as hard, harrowing as I, it may sound me just teasing it that way, but Charlie has a little pocket knife, a little razor blade type of thing, and there's, a, there's an event that happens with a social worker coming in, I guess, to review uh, his situation there that is a harmless situation, but you know the way it's perceived and the way it's seen and the impact it had. It was pretty... It got a little scary, oh, yeah. and and but yet, it was just it was a rough scene. That's all I can say about it. It was it was well, tough, I know, but well I know. put together. Um, <laughs> um, yes, I, I was sitting beside you, and I know that you don't like scenes with. No, no, I don't like that. So yeah, that was that tough to watch anyway. And sure, then to see it continue, the impact it had was <laughs> oh, not, not easy. <laughs> yeah, but well done. I think sure. it, it really added some. It added, it added some physical horror to oh. what was already an emotionally horror sure. situation for him. So, yeah. I've got, I've got no dislikes. No. I, I mean, I, I really either. tried to find something to pick apart on this film, and I've got nothing. No, it, it's one of my favorite films of the year. Tackles yeah. a subject, sensitive subject with humor, but it has a lot of realism and a dash of hope. So it's not yeah. like it's just bleak despair. Yeah, that's a good point to say that you know, just to kind of give a little counseling to everybody there. Don't, don't think of this, even this film about divorce and a marriage ending, don't go in thinking it's just going to be this complete bleak, hopeless, right. Depressing thing. It does have its moments of depressing that. and, and, <laughs> sure. uh, and, and tough situations, but I do love the way this film ends and it has a lot to say about kind of the state of marriages and relationships, I think in, in our society right now. So, uh, I think it's I think it's a great film. It'll definitely be showing up in my favorites of the year here in a few months. I'm pretty positive about that. So, cool. all right. Well, that is released on December 6th on Netflix. So if you're listening to this uh, before December 6th, you just got a little bit to wait. After December 6th, it should be available for you streaming on Netflix, which seems to be Mr. Bombeck's preferred <laughs> method of delivery nowadays. Apparently, so we'll see how yeah. that goes. All right, let's take a quick break, and when we come back, uh, we've got. Uh, a new segment called This Could Be Good, or is that going to be the name for it, or will it be, yeah. will this be good? I think, could can this be good? Yeah, it sounds like it could be good. Yeah. Something with good is definitely the last word with the upward with tick the in our good? voice. Yeah. Like ending that way. <laughs> then we're also going to talk through a couple trailers in our Trailers Tapas segment, and then we'll have Chris with a soapbox item to rant about for a few minutes. So stay tuned. Uh, after that, we'll also have our recommendations. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with Foot Candle Films here on The Mesh in just a moment. Hey, this is Moose from Street Circle Drive. That's the Hickory, North Carolina-centric podcast here on The Mesh. Be sure to check out our show and all the others at themesh.tv. Welcome back to Foot Candle Films here on themesh.tv. My name is Alan Jackson, and with me again, Chris Fry, with the Foot Candle Film Society and the Foot Candle Film Festival. Uh, In the first half of our show, we talked about the film's um, marriage Story, which we both gave high, high praise to. I feel like it's a great film to check out and watch. And also talked about the film The Lighthouse. A little more, uh, a little less positive on that one, but at least something worth seeing for just the style and uh, production design of the film. So, Chris, with that, we're going to move into our other part of the show where we have some news items to do. We kind of group them into our little segments, try to keep them in the little buckets that we can play with. And one of those first buckets is something I've just noticed we've been doing a lot in our show, where we find projects that are in early stages, starting to build up, have not been released yet, but we're starting to get more and more information about. And that information is either going to make us feel more positive about the film or could hurt our impressions of the film. It's a little segment we're calling... Sounds like it could be good. There you go. I like the way, exactly the way you said it there. Sounds (laughs) like it could be good. So, Chris, what is today's Sounds Like It Could Be Good film for us to discuss? So, they have announced a date for the next uh, movie in the DC universe that will involve this character. The Batman is the title of it. The Batman. The Batman. Okay. Suppose it's going to be in theaters June 25th, 2021. And here's the cast. So, we got a year and a half. Right. Okay. We have Robert Pattinson as Batman. Robert Pattinson, who we just talked about in uh, The Lighthouse. Correct. Okay. Zoe Kravitz as Catwoman. Andy Serkis as Alfred. Paul Dano as the Riddler. Colin Farrell as Penguin. Jeffrey Wright as Commissioner Gordon. Matt Reeves, who was responsible for some of the Planet of the Apes reboots, is directing The Batman. Okay. So. 
All right, so let's pick so this apart sound, a little the bit. This sounds like it could be good. <laughs> Uh, it sounds interesting, that's for sure. It is a sure. DC film, though, so it has that strike against it. <laughs> well, but, you know, I like to Joker. Um, I think when DC tries to do something a little different, it may actually work out, and maybe this is so it. So will this be kind of a standalone? Would they dare to make a Batman standalone film, kind of like the no. Joker scene? Probably not with no. all these, like, bad guys in there. No, I don't even think Joker's going to be a standalone movie. I think they're going to find a way to milk uh, that for some more money. Gotcha. Um, Robert Pattinson, I'm intrigued by. Oh, and I, I actually watched The Lighthouse kind of thinking a little bit, could this guy be Bruce Wayne Batman? I'm like, yeah, I could totally I see it. I thought how he disappeared, I forgot to mention this in our review of The Lighthouse, but how he disappeared into the role of playing this like lighthouse keeper. I forgot I was looking at Robert Pattinson. You know, true, whenever I've seen him before, it's like, no, I'm looking at pretty boy Mr. Pattinson you know, with the twilight sheen and mm-hmm. halo around him. No, that was, that was gone. It totally disappeared into the character. I can see him being a pretty good and because you see a little bit in the lighthouse, like a little bit of a dark, tortured soul type yeah, yeah. thing. Yeah, he could definitely play that so, a little better. No, he's he's he has come around the last several years and done some really interesting projects, and I like where where he is right now. Um, Jeffrey Wright is Commissioner Gordon, all for it. Love sure. it. I think that's great. He I like him. He 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 has a lot of gravitas on screen. He can play a little rough but smart character and i think that's what you need from a good commissioner gordon plus he's not only uh, appearance wise and style wise very different from what we saw with um in the dark knight trilogy yeah with gary oldman, gary oldman playing him, and even going back to the uh gosh i don't even remember who played him in the uh burton films right I don't Pat, uh, oh, I don't remember. Anyway, so yeah, I like the fact that it's a different take on Gordon, which I'm all for, and sure. I think that'll be great. Now, when we get to the villains, um, Zoe Kravitz, you said? That's, I mean, granted, I don't think filming has quite started yet, so these might change, but this is the latest as yeah, of like yeah, no, a week right. or so ago. Zoe, that's what I've heard too. She's announced as Catwoman. Yeah. I'm all for that yeah. as well. I think that's yeah. great. Uh, I've only seen her in a couple of things, but... Uh, she seems like a really good actress, and this could be the kind of role that really defines her for for the, uh, the movie going audience. Paul Dano as the Riddler is probably the most intriguing one. Oh, really? I was going to say Andy Serkis as Alfred is pretty odd. No, I, I don't to think me, that's that seems odd. odd. I mean, our, Alfred's good, always yeah. Sure. Alfred's always Alfred's been portrayed so many different ways True. by different characters that I I wasn't blown away by that. Um, I mean, I think I really liked uh, Jeremy Irons' version in those horrible <laughs> DC movies, which is a shame because he was a good Alfred. He was like one of the few things I'd like, I thought worked in those films, but um, no, Andy Serkis will be really interesting. I think he'll be great. Oh no, I, th- I think he will be too. I'm just, I read the name. I was like, huh? No, it was gonna okay. Be. But Paul Dano, I, I'm just surprised Paul Dano is signing onto a superhero film because that he's done some very eclectic films and yes. very. I mean, are you you're not choices. surprised that Colin Farrell is going to be the Penguin? I'm not surprised Colin Farrell's involved in the project. I am surprised Colin Farrell's playing the Penguin. <laughs> so <laughs> because I get the impression they're going for a very different take of the Penguin. It's not going to be the I'm I mean, fine with. Yeah, because I mean, considering who had done the Penguin before for Tim Burton, it's like Dan, Dan DeVito. DeVito. That yeah. was like. You know. Well, we, we're going to get a version, I think, closer to the TV Gotham version that we had for several seasons, where it's a, you know, it's not this grotesque character of a person. He's just a really savvy business person, or and with a little bit of a, a, a criminal streak to him. Mm-hmm. So I think if we're going to get that type of penguin, you know, uh, it'll be interesting to see what they do with it. Um, I this is shaping up to be one of the most interesting independent superhero films ever <laughs> because <laughs> all of these actors are ones that you normally know for some different, more unique choices, which, you know, that's the whole sounds like it could be good because as I mentioned, when we were talking about marriage story, quite the ensemble, which could be good yeah, or could be bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, and everything's shaping up good. I mean, Matt Reeves, I think is good. As a director, I mean, I do like the two Planet of the Eight films he did. I thought they had a really good good look to them. But he's done what else again beyond that? Um, I don't know. Planet of the Apes are the ones I'm familiar with, so I'd have to hit on. up IMDb and see. I was what... not, uh, not completely prepared for this, so let me see what I've got. <laughs> sure. Uh, director, 
Um, War of the Planet of the Apes, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. That's okay. the second and third of the trilogy okay. of those. Both he good. did Let Me In, which was the remake of the Let, Let the Right One In horror film. Okay. And he did Cloverfield, okay. which I didn't really care for. So No, but I don't know that I would lump that at the feet of the director. Yeah. Maybe, so. everything, with, everything at that point beyond that was TV. So really, he's only made two big budget, like, in my mind, really good films. Gotcha. Um, but we'll see. And I have not seen Let, Let Me In. I never saw that remake of it. I didn't either. I saw the original, but didn't see the remake. Yeah. So. All right. Well, I'm with you. I think it could be good. <laughs> and we're going to definitely keep an eye on it and see what happens here as we go forward. But, uh, you know, we're both big fans of the character. I'm all for reinventing the character every few years just to give us kind of a new take on him. This one is starting to sound very interesting. What I love about it, Chris, the, the tagline I've heard and how much of this actually they do in the film, I don't know. But they're really trying to play up this idea of him being the world's greatest detective, which mm. I love that. Interesting. That's one thing I don't think any of the other films really ever touched on. Yeah, actually like clues and yeah. trying to piece together things. That, trying to solve that could be mysteries really cool. and riddles and all so that. So yeah, instead That's of like cool an thing. action movie, it could actually be kind of a suspense type mm-hmm. thing. That, that would be interesting. If that's the direction they go, cool. I'm totally digging it. Oh, that yeah. would be awesome. All right, Chris. So trailers... Like tapas in a restaurant, little little morsels, little things that we can kind of eat and, and consume in a little batch. And all together, hopefully, they make a really nice meal for us. That's why we have our trailer tapas section as well. You have a couple of trailers that you want us to kind of uh, uh, taste yeah. at this point, so right? If, yeah, sure. So the first one I'd like to uh, let us sample would be uh, Invisible Man. The Invisible Man. Yes. The Invisible the Man. The Invisible Man. The Invisible Man. Here we go. As the attorney representing Adrian's trust, I'm required to read a prepared statement. Cecilia, although our relationship was far from perfect, I thought that you would talk to me rather than run away. Are you okay? What happened to him? He cut his wrist. Per his final wishes, you're getting $5 million. Contingent, of course, on the fine print. It can't be ruled to be mentally incompetent. It just doesn't make any sense. What? Adrian wouldn't kill himself. Listen, you're getting your freedom back, okay? Don't let him haunt you. Hello? He was a sociopath, completely in control of everything. He said that wherever I went, he would find me, walk right up to me, and I wouldn't be able to see him. Are you okay? Someone sitting in that chair. I found something that can prove what I'm experiencing. You need help. Adrian is dead. He's not dead. I have a pile of ashes in the box that would disagree with you. He has figured out a way to be invisible. The only thing more brilliant than inventing something that makes you invisible is coming up with the perfect way to torture you, even in death. Adrian's true genius was how he got in people's heads. Don't come any closer. Hey! I'm not crazy. You're saying the person trying to kill you is in the room right now, but we can't see him? He's listening. Where are you? Where are you? Show yourself! Come on! Do it! There you are. Okay, so that was the trailer for The Invisible Man. Yes, it was. Alan is shaking his head while sitting across from me. All right, not so really sure how to take that. Just a, just a couple parts. So, I, And I know listening on audio, it's not as sure. good to hear the trailer that way. So I do encourage you to at least check it out online and see. So little interesting notes about this film that I'm realizing. You couldn't... Okay, so there again, you may not have recognized her voice. Elizabeth Moss yep. is the person who's the central character. Elizabeth Moss, who that's one reason why I think the film could be interesting. Sure. Because I do like 
I do like Elizabeth Moss. I think she's a really great actress. And her putting her name to this lends some credibility to it. thing that concerns me a bit is, do you remember a few years ago, Universal had this whole plan of making the dark universe and the mummy with Tom Cruise uh, was the first Which you movie. liked. Which I, you okay. liked. <laughs> All right, hold on. Like is a strong word. I think the mummy was fairly, was badly uh, misjudged. It's not a great movie, but I thought it was at least passable entertainment for a couple of hours where other people are saying it's like the worst movie ever made. Uh, I thought it was okay. But it was meant to kick off this whole dark universe that, it, where Universal was going to take their classic monster characters mm-hmm. and do new, updated, modern versions of them. So you had The Mummy with Tom Cruise tanked. People hated it. So then you didn't hear anything more about the dark universe. All right. However, this one... It's kind of kind of picking that back up again. So the Invisible Man is a classic Universal character property, and Universal is now making a new film based on that, based on the original H.G. Wells novel, uh, with a modern take on it. Right. Um, Johnny Depp was attached to be in the Invisible Man for a long, long time, back when Tom Cruise was doing the Mummy, and then I think <laughs> that all fell through. Um, I think that's probably for the best that that fell through. Probably so. Uh, this film is going to be a wait and see for me. I sure. love the classic Universal horror movies. I love the idea of an Invisible Man movie. Um, I think it's, he's a fascinating character. I, I just don't know how this take's going to go. Bloomhouse is involved. Yes. The production house has been making a lot of lower budget horror films and pretty good ones in most cases. Mm-hmm. Um, they were involved with Jordan Peele's films, weren't they? Um, uh, Get Out, were they involved with us as well? I don't know if they were with us, but, but I'm pretty sure Get, Get Out, Out yeah. they were. And also they got involved with uh, M. Night Shyamalan, his last mm-hmm. couple films that, uh, you know, were a little on the better yeah, side. Yeah, both Split and Glass, I think, were yeah. both house. Yeah. So this is a wait and see for me. I'm curious, but I'm going to have to hear some people tell me. My problem with the trailer is I feel like the trailer, the last 30 seconds of the trailer pretty much hmm. gave away so much of the film. Got you. I would have much preferred if the trailer left it very ambiguous whether this character is imagining things or not, whether it was true or not. That could have been a lot more interesting film than where I'm afraid it's going to go sure. based on the trailer. So, But Elizabeth Moss is always interesting, so it could be yeah. good. Yeah, she tends to do pretty interesting projects. And to go from this year's Her Smell to go to yeah. The Invisible Man, it's kind of interesting. So, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, are you at all... Curious, interested? Or? I am curious. Um, I probably, it's kind of probably a wait and see, like you were saying, yeah. but I am curious. Whereas if you just told me it was an invisible man, maybe I'd be like, okay. Um, I wouldn't have been that interested in it. But the fact that Elizabeth Moss has signed on to it, and the trailer looks like it's a well made film, sure. maybe a bit too predictable, maybe, but it, I don't know. It seems I'm just afraid it shows too much. Sure. That's again, that's more of the trailer, not a problem with the film itself. So, you yeah. know. Um, all right, let's go and talk about the second trailer you want to bring up. Yeah, so this will be the latest from Pixar. It's called Soul, and it stars the voice talents of Tina Fey and Jamie Lee Fox. What would you want to be known for on Earth? We only have a short time on this planet. You want to become the person that you were born to be? Don't waste your time on all the junk of life. What am I doing? Spend your precious hours doing what will bring out the real you. The brilliant, passionate you. That's ready to contribute something meaningful into this world. I got the gig. I really need a haircut today, man. Can you fit me in? Whoa, whoa, sorry. for doing this funny cowboy dance. <laughs> Great. Okay, Alan. Uh, 
Your thoughts on the trailer for Soul? Uh, I mean, I'm sure this is going to be a good movie. <laughs> um, however. However, I, I just, anyway, well, I'll go ahead and say right off the bat. I love the fact that they are making this, seems to be a lot more African-American culture. Sure. Having a lot more uh, people that don't look like the people they typically have in Pixar films, which is great. I think that's well-deserved. So that was really exciting to see. I mean, there just seems to be a lot of uh, more uh, more African-American culture exhibited in the trailer, even this short little teaser trailer. Sure. That's great. I'm, I'm all for that. And I think that's going to be a really nice uh, twist uh, for t- Pixar to do something a little more diverse. That being said, um, so this seems to be another movie about either afterlife or kind of what's going on in people's heads. So they were very intentional to say this is a studio that brought you Inside Out and Coco, which is two films that are a little similar in their storytelling devices. So as soon as I realized this is a film about someone's actual soul, I'm like, uh, hmm, okay, I'll, We'll see how this goes. It really kind of had me intrigued up until that part. And then it's like, eh, okay, I don't know. I feel like we've already been on this path with Pixar a little bit lately. Yeah, I, unfortunately, you know, how boring. You and I are on the same page. Yeah. Uh, because the trailer that we just played, you know, it has one tone and look to all the animation. Mm-hmm. Just and cool. then is, there's a point in the trailer, basically, the gentleman looks like he falls down a manhole. And like we assume he, he dies. We don't know. We don't know, but... But then what we do know, according to the trailer, is the animation style then completely switches to something I will call the inside out, inside out style. Yeah. Or kind of that type. And that's what concerned me, too, because I was like, oh, this is basically going to do a retread of Coco. Like, smash up or mash up Coco and Inside Out together. Yeah, yeah. And throw in some musical ideas, and that's what this movie... So... Like you say, I'm sure it will be good, but I'm not as interested in it now because of that. So. No, I'm I'm with you. Actually, it, it lost. I heard Jamie Foxx was going to be, you know, kind of the lead on it, which I think is great. Mm-hmm. I think he's a he's got a future as a as a voice talent because I do think he's. Oh yeah, he can do a lot really, with just his voice. He he can act with his voice extremely well. Sure. And um, so that's good. And um, Tina Fey's involved, which I like Tina Fey a lot. So you know, I'm also good with that. But, yeah, the whole conceit of it being the whole soul and yeah. once he turned into, like, that little animated character that was... Like a uh, blob of toothpaste. Yeah, kind of like it's just, again, it's... I feel like we've seen this. I yeah. feel like we've already had this, and uh, I don't know. It just made it a little tougher for me to be excited about it now, but I'm sure it's going to be good. I mean, it's a it's a Pixar film. They do mostly big hit, good stuff. They've had a few misfires, but we will see. So, Chris, that was two trailers we want to kind of talk through, and I think some interesting, I think wait and see on both of them for me to see kind of how they play out when they're actually released. But you had a you had another thought to share, kind of our soapbox segment. I got to take the soapbox last time, the whole Martin Scorsese Marvel thing I, I took on head on. But, Chris, I want to hear what's what's bugging you right now in the film community. What do you want to talk about? Well, okay. First off, disclaimer, I have not seen a film called Lionheart or a film called Joy. Both are up for, will be up for the best international feature film, or will they? Because right, you said best international feature film. That's that correct. That sounds different than it what the... It is no longer best foreign language film, huh. which you would think would make the following that I'm about to mention a non-issue, but it doesn't. Lionheart, which was to be the foreign film or best international feature film entry from Nigeria. That was to be Lionheart. But the Academy said, you know what? That's not cool. You can't do it because most of the dialogue in the film is in English, which seems like that would have held water if we were still doing foreign language film instead of best international feature film. But they said, nope. Too much of the film is in English. Too but, much of the film is in English, even though the film's produced, made, shot in another country. Add on to that, the language of Nigeria, like the language that you know, is English. So, so they're penalizing <laughs> another country because it's not in because Africa. They're using their native language there. Well, I mean, like the language that most of right. the country speaks. They still may have like tribal dialects well, sure, and stuff, but, but, but like most people speak majority English of people there. speak is English, See, and they're penalizing. I I feel like the academy got into a 
it was bad to name the category best foreign language film to begin with because yes. I'm afraid people are taking it literally. Right. And that's not the way – that's not the spirit of the award. The spirit of the award is to recognize films being made in other countries other than the United States. Correct. And you may think, okay, well, this is an isolated incident. incident. Nope. Another film has already been disqualified as well. This was is called Joy, and it's an Oscar entry from Austria. Okay. Okay. Now, it actually, interestingly enough, Lionheart's from Nigeria. Joy talks about uh, sex trafficking of young Mm -hmm. women and stuff um, from Nigeria. But the story actually, I guess, takes place in Europe. So it's Austria's entry. Here again, their beef is, I guess, because of all the different cultures going on or wherever, it's it's in English. So lots of it's in English. Even though it is made in Austria, like crew and everything, you know, doesn't matter. It's like, nope. It's not foreign language. Even though the title of the category for this year's not will be Best International Feature Film. Well, I like the fact that they changed the name. I was hoping they, them changing the name of the, of the award would mean they realized it was kind of ridiculous to be blocking these films just because of, their, of the choice of language they use. Well, and here's, but it sounds like that's still the here's case. Here's my issue. If Nigeria, if Austria picks a film and says, this is what we're putting forward as the best film that was made in our country. I don't care if it's 100% in English. Yeah. If, they, if, they, if that country is saying, no, this is what we want to put forward as our film, I think the Oscars should be like, okay. Yeah, yeah. And then they whittle down the big list to the five, and that's mm. the – but, like, how dare they – not even let it be the Yeah, how dare they be like, you know what, Nigeria, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't – like, that just – irritates me beyond no, I agree. I completely agree. I completely agree with you. I'm actually disappointed in that I thought the whole point of them changing the name of the award was to kind of give some recognition and say, yeah, that was kind of an antiquated way of looking at it. Uh, but now it sounds like that that's still going to be a barrier to, to filmmakers. So what if a film was silent, a silent <laughs> film, like, you know, what, what would be the qualification? Would it be accepted? Good because question. There was no language used at all. Quite, or no, it wouldn't be accepted because there wasn't enough foreign language. <laughs> like who, who knows? I think it's. But the thing they well, just, then in that category, then you're saying, if I made a film here in the United States, was but I did it film. all in French. <laughs> I mean, it's done in America, oh, but uh, would it be a foreign language th- film? Then I guess by that, yeah. See, that, and I, it blows my mind. You know, it'd be one thing if they're like, no, it's best foreign language film. You're like, oh, so it has to be in a foreign language. But no, they changed the category already. Yeah, yeah. To best international film feature film. And, no, I'm uh, with you on this. I, I can't. I can't argue with you on this. I mean, I'm totally in your camp. Dumb. It's it's dumb. It's yeah. really dumb. Anything that blocks a really good film from being seen and recognized and awarded, yeah. it's, dumb. it's I, dumb. I think there's just that's why I don't be- agree with people who say that Netflix films or other films that go online shouldn't be recognized for awards. I'm like, I don't care. I don't care where it shows. I don't care what language it's in. I just want to recognize the best films we can and. Those kind of stupid little rules and qualifications, I think, just really hurt the hurt the whole process. And I think it's just an example of you know, Academy Awards c- complains every year, like, oh, our viewership is down, and you know, well, you know, you seem like you're the old man. You know, get off my lawn, yeah, yeah. kids. Like, what do you, at, what do you expect? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I agree. So. Uh, I absolutely agree. Well, I am with you on your soapbox, Chris. Okay. I mean, I, I, I get it. I'm with you. Cool. You know, so, Academy. <laughs> You're on notice. Come Step on. Up. Let's fix this up, all right? I'm waiting <laughs> for you. All right. Well, that's rounding out our news. So could this be good? The Batman? Our prognosis is, yeah, sounds like it could be good. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, sure. Trailers, uh, The Invisible Man and Soul. Soul. We're both in kind of a wait-and-see position on these. Both have potential, but both could also drop down a manhole pretty easily if uh, <laughs> they're, they're not careful. Sure. And then Chris's thoughts on the... Best International Film Award, which I completely agree with you on. All right, Chris, let's wrap up the shows with our recommendation. This is where each of us shares a film that we've either recently caught up with or uh, just kind of brought back up to our memory that we wanted to share with the audience and say, you know what, this is something maybe you should check out if you're looking for a film to to, uh, fill in your viewing viewing history this coming weekend. Um, Chris, if it's okay with you, I'll go first. Sure. Um, Because I know you love this film. (laughs) That's being facetious. I know you don't. I know you think it's boring and tiring, but Moneyball is a film that has been on my watch list for a really long time. It's a film I've always wanted to see, but it's just always set on that list. And I think a little bit of you 
downplaying it a couple years ago, telling me that it was boring and no good, has <laughs> reduced my enthusiasm when I see okay, it. Okay, which is good for you. You like going into yeah, movies yeah, with low good. expectations. Uh, so Billy Bean, who is the general manager of the Oakland A's in the film, I actually saw him, kind of met him years okay. and years ago at a statistics conference. That sounds like a fascinating yes. conference First to go off, to. Yes, statistics conferences do exist. <laughs> it's not just a dream. Okay. And two, or a nightmare in my I case. Do, I okay. do enjoy them. Okay. <laughs> so, Fair enough. Um, but I did go because obviously his whole role with what he brought to the ba- game of baseball is the idea of numbers and statistics and bringing logic into the into the idea. Right. So Moneyball is a adaptation of a book based on Billy Bean meeting. Uh, uh, Peter Brand, played by Jonah Hill, and Billy Bean, played by Brad Pitt. Peter Brand became the assistant GM, and he's the one that brought in this formula, this idea of kind of measuring players based on how many times they get on base versus home run averages and all the big stats that we normally look at, and taking this more sophisticated approach and more uh, to looking at analyzing players. So this film, uh, directed by, oh gosh, I'll have to look that back up a little bit. It's okay. the same guy who did Capote. I know that, but I just don't remember his name. I'm blanking on his name now yeah, as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the film, Brad Pitt and Jonah Hill uh, in this uh, drama. And I will say the film is not as strong as I wanted it to be. Okay, so I'm not giving it the highest marks. But I do think it was a good movie. I think it has a lot to say about taking risk in your professional career. And I think the the, the key players played that that role that that dangerous uh, decisions are making very well um i think it has a lot to do with kind of combating the whole ignoring the way we've always done it kind of the old-fashioned traditional way and trying to introduce something new into a system to see what it works um so from those aspects i liked it and i thought both pitt and jonah hill were both very good uh billy bean had to be played as kind of a hothead a little superstitious someone maybe a little difficult to interact with on a personal level I think Brad Pitt played that off pretty well. Jonah Hill had to play smart, confident, but also uncomfortable given the level of responsibility that Billy Bean places on him. And both of them, I thought, played their roles really, really well. The thing that made me a little heartbroken watching this movie, Philip Seymour Hoffman has a very small part Hmm. as a manager of the team. But watching him just reminds me, man, we lost a really good talent. He's a good one. (laughs) He's a good one. Even in his maybe three or four scenes he had with a very, very limited dialogue, because he played someone who's kind of a a man of few words anyway. He's just really good. So it was, I liked every moment he was on the screen and disappointed he wasn't in there more. Um, I will say the last 30 minutes of the film were a bit rushed. Maybe didn't give quite the, post world series ramifications I was looking for in the story. Uh, so it left me a little unfulfilled at the end, but overall I think the storytelling worked and I did like the performances. So I'm giving a recommendation to Moneyball, despite what Mr. Chris Fry has <laughs> said in the past, uh, for sure here, we'll play just a quick little, quick little teaser of the trailer here. There are rich teams and there are poor teams. Then there's 50 feet of crap. And then there's us. That's a dollar, man. What? Welcome to Oakland. I need more money. We're not New York. Find players with the money that we do have. I like Perez. Got an ugly girlfriend. Ugly girlfriend means no confidence. You guys are talking the same old nonsense. Like we're looking for Fabio. We got to think differently. Who's Fabio? So yeah, that's my recommendation. Moneyball. I think it's a good film, especially if you have any interest at all in the subject matter and the the topic and uh, kind of exploring this use of numbers, mathematics, and statistics in the world of our America's greatest pastime. Chris, what recommendation do you have for us? So, like, Did you want to argue about Moneyball, by the way? You know, it would, I looked up while you were uh, giving your description. It was done by Bennett Miller. Bennett Miller. So he did that's Capote. It. He also did Foxcatcher. Uh, I guess that's one of his more recent ones oh, in 2014. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Um, so I like that film. Yeah, I think... I think Moneyball just kind of lulled me. I uh, saw it later at night, maybe it kind of put me to sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, it, and it, you know, it was a lot of Sorkin dialogue who helped oh, with yeah, the screenplay right. yeah, and, and the got screenplay. really wordy. And it's like, took something that should be exciting and just made it like a bunch of people talking and made it boring. Um, kind of like, you know, yeah, it just, it just, it didn't work for me, sure. but you know, maybe it's worth giving a, a revisit too. So could be. 
in between all those screenings, the, sure. the film all screeners the, we yeah. got to be watching. So, yeah. Speaking of yeah. all the uh, screeners that we've gotten that we're supposed to watch mm-hmm. for year-end awards, um, I'm going to mention one that I have been able to review. And if you want to pull up a trailer for it, <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I'm going to mention one called Greener Grass. Um, it's directed by Jocelyn DeBoer and Don Lube, or I'm not sure how you say her last name, Luby. Um, but uh, we'll hear a little bit of the trailer, and because uh, you kind of pulled up. Okay, and Dennis, take a step to your left. Bob, let's see that smile. Don't you talk about my facelift. Mm. He doesn't smile anymore. Oh, I'm losing Twilson. If you could just rotate him forward and perfect. I'm never a first. So, so tell me about this film, Chris, because I've been very curious. Yeah. Um, it's as if David Lynch directed Pleasantville and with the stylistics of like a Wes Anderson movie, maybe, um, as far as like framing and bright colors, but it just, it is one of the oddest things I've seen in a while. <laughs> Wow. And the thing is, you know, we actually talked about with Lighthouse, you know, there wasn't a lot of meat on the bones. You kind of like, yeah, I needed something more. I will admit, in the first five minutes or so, I was kind of like, okay, this seems like, which mm-hmm. if you're understanding correctly, you say some of these people are SNL alums or yeah. are on right mm-hmm. now. It seems like a skit that would take place at like the twelve thirty slot or twelve forty five slot. It's just like the 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 famous ten to one slot. Right, last ten minutes. Cut it, cut it if time allows. You know, and you're just kind of like, okay, there's something funny here, but they need to wrap it up. But you're like, well, the movie is over a hundred. It's like over a hundred minutes long. So what? Where is this going? At the end, I think I have figured out, but I don't want to spoil anything. I think I have figured out kind of what it's doing and where it's going. It's, it is, I really liked it. If you like films that are a little, little odd, um, I would recommend for the, and the sense of humor in this film is just really bizarre. Or like if Andy Kaufman and David Lynch directed a movie together. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because a lot of it's got kind of that Andy Kaufman kind of like, okay, that's just odd. It's funny, but it's more odd than funny. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, so this, I, I'm recommending uh, Greener Grass. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and say this. I don't normally like to play up star ratings and all that as much. I mean, we kind of use that as a little bit of a framing reference. But yeah, I woke up this morning, and I'm doing my normal morning routine, go let the dog out, kind of fix some coffee and all that. <laughs> Flip on Letterbox just to see if there's any movies people are watching. I'm like, oh my God, Chris gave something five stars. What, what would this be? <laughs> so... Now I am super intrigued is uh, something I will be watching very, very quickly now. So, yeah, it's it's uh, worth checking out. I think you, uh, you know, if you're not a critic who gets a bunch of year end screeners, um, it is available on iTunes. Um, OK, so you can so get iTunes. Can see it right now. Yes. Mm-hmm. Good, good. Yeah, I don't think it's in theaters anymore, but it is on iTunes. So is this Chris's Bad Times at the Yale Royale pick of the year or so i i don't know uh, but yeah, it would definitely see. qualify in that category in that maybe it's not my top film of the year but it definitely qualifies with something that i would say is underseen yeah yeah um mm-hmm. so yeah interesting oh, no, that's Let's an interesting way to frame out, it yeah. <laughs> yeah all right well that is greener grass which uh, as chris said is available on itunes you can rent mm-hmm. it there and uh and then my recommendation was a little older film but moneyball with brad pitt so two films we think are worth your time checking out. And I think, Chris, that wraps it up for us today. Okay. So we did The Lighthouse. Eh. We were a little mixed on. <laughs> and we did Marriage Story that we both feel like is one of the best films we've seen this year. Right. Uh, then we had our news items. And then we wrapped up our recommendations, Greener Grass and Moneyball. So I think that wraps up our show. But, Chris, we, we throw out a lot of opinions, even your soapbox idea, all these things. If people wanted to... Talk with us, spar with us, comment on anything we've had to say. How would they do so? So you can send us an email at info at the mesh dot TV. Mention foot candle films in the subject line. And yes, spar with us electronically through email. That'd be a good way to start up a dialogue. We you know, may mention it here on the show and uh, talk about it in our, one of our news segments. So that's a good way to get in contact with us. Uh, we also both have, as Alan mentioned, we have accounts on uh, Letterboxd. And you can follow kind of what films we're watching and maybe brief reviews about what we have thought of them. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I know we're kind of in between festival time, but just go ahead and put on your calendar. September 20, <laughs> what is the date, Chris? Oh, man. Um, last weekend of September. Yes, last full last weekend full in September. Weekend of September. I think it's like the 23rd through the 27th, maybe, okay. uh, but I'm not sure. Uh, basically, that last weekend of September. Yep. You'll hear us talk about it as we get closer, but that'll be our annual film festival. If you are a filmmaker, know someone who's a filmmaker, or just have some connection with a film that's been made in the past year, and you're looking to submit your film for a festival consideration, uh, the Foot Candle Film Festival is now open for submissions. You can go to footcandlefilmfestival.com, and there's a big button that'll be on the homepage there that says uh, submit your film, and it'll take you to our um, film, film freeway. freeway site where you can submit. And uh, the festival is not till September, but we will be accepting uh, contra- uh, submissions from now until through June. June. Yeah. Until June. So, until yeah, June. it opened up November 1st and goes till June 1st. The sooner you submit, the uh, lower the fees are and all. So, it's good Correct. to go ahead and get in there early. And uh, I'm in the midst of college applications. So, they got the whole early deadline and <laughs> they keep saying, uh, go ahead and apply now. You need sure. to apply sooner. It's the same way with our film submissions. Right. I'll tell you, just go ahead and get it in there. Go ahead and submit it. Uh, we'd love to take a look at it and have our committee review it. And then you'll get your acceptance letter possibly in July. <laughs> With everybody else. But that's okay. <laughs> but that's okay. We still say right. do it early. Just go ahead and get it out of the way and do it. And uh, we hope to see some of your films uh, or films you're connected to at the film festival next September. All right, Chris, that'll do it for the show. Uh, this has been Foot Candle Films here on the TheMesh.TV. I encourage you to check us out at footcandle.org to learn what our film society is doing and screenings we have going on here in the western North Carolina area or Foot Candle Film Festival will be where you want to go in the coming months as we start prepping for next year's festival so thanks so much for listening and we'll talk to you at the next episode see you in the ticket line Special thanks to Carpal Tuller for the show theme music. For more about Carpal Tuller, visit www.carpaltuller.com. You've been listening to The Mesh, an online media network of shows and programs ranging from business to arts, sports to entertainment, music to community. All programs are available on the website as well as through iTunes and YouTube. Check us out online at themesh.tv. Discover other network shows and give us feedback on what you just heard.